Let's turn to our Bibles to John chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 to uh, 1 through 11. And I've titled this message, A Fragrance That Fills the Room. And as we're preparing for the Christmas season, a lot of us spent a lot of time with family this last week celebrating Thanksgiving. And it was a time of eating, a time of fellowship, and it gives us a clear picture of the heart of Jesus. And so tonight, as we look at this, we're going to take a look at an act of worship. This message is going to center on worship. This message is going to center on our style of worship to the Lord as we take a look at a beautiful picture of what worship is. And so what I want to do is I want to read the first eight verses and then we'll get into our study. But let's pray real quick, you guys, again. Jesus, bless this time. We ask that your name is glorified and honored. Holy Spirit, we invite you here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Then it, verse chapter 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been raised, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus, who was one of those who sat at the table with him, then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his and anointed, I'm sorry, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he, that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for my day of burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. One thing that stands out about Jesus is his love for people. Jesus spent a great amount of time loving and ministering to them. The New Testament points out that Jesus would often eat meals with different people. The importance of eating and dining back in those days were, was meant that you were accepted and that you would accept the people that you had over. And Jesus simply loved the people and enjoyed spending time with them and reaching out to them and ministering to them and, and fellowshipping with them. Some of Jesus' greatest lessons were given as he was eating meals with his disciples. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, while sitting at the table with many tax collectors and sinners, Jesus' message was, I, call the, I come to call the sinners to repentance. In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, a Pharisee invites Jesus to eat with him, where a woman comes to, and anoints his feet, and his message was, to him little is forgiven, the same loves little. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Jesus is welcome into the home where one sister is caught up in serving and worried about her sister not helping her. And, and as she sat at the feet of Jesus, and, and Jesus' message at that time was, but one thing is needed. So we see that Jesus has given lots of great instruction during times of meals. And here we have another meal that is presented in this lesson that I think we can really embrace here the context tells us in verse 1 that this event took place during the last week of Jesus' ministry. Here in verse 1, we're given a timetable of when this, is going to take, when this is taking place. And it says it's six days before the Passover. This is Jesus' last week. It's his passion week before he would be brutally executed on the cross. His amazing love for others and fellowship with others, even in the face of his brutal death, and that's just who our Jesus is, selfless. And we see here that the context and the setting here is one week before he's crucified. In verse 2, we see that they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the room and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. The, sitting, the setting that we have here in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 8, tells us that this house belonged to a man named Simon the leper. It also reveals that Jesus and the rest of his disciples were here at this, at this meal as well. 
It's interesting to point out that Matthew, uh, that Matthew and Mark do mention Simon the leper, but here in the book of John, we don't see that Simon is mentioned. He was a previous leper who had been cleansed by Jesus. And so it's important to point out that this dinner could have been given for one or two reasons. This could have been a dinner of appreciation for Jesus cleansing Simon the leper, or it could have been Jesus that is being honored with a supper and gratitude for raising Lazarus from the dead. I could imagine this conversation that was going on around this dinner table. If I was able to be a fly on the wall during that conversation, this is what I would imagine that would take place. I could imagine Simon the leper or the ex-leper saying, you can't imagine what it was like. I saw the scabs fall off my hand and my fingers grew back in place and I reached up and touched my face and I was able to feel it and I was healed. For leprosy is a disease known in the biblical times that was a flesh-eating disease. It would cause skin sores and nerve damage and muscle weakness and it got worse over time. Then perhaps I can imagine Lazarus interrupting and say, no, 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 that, no way, Simon, that's nothing. Yeah, what Jesus did for you was great, but I was dead in the tomb for four days. And you know what was the good thing about this? Is I went to paradise and I seen Abraham, I seen Isaac, I seen Jacob. But I tell you the most amazing thing that I saw is when I came back to the tomb and had the rags removed from my face and everyone's eyes were this big. I could imagine that conversation that was going on. But we see in verse 2 that there was a supper that was made and Martha served. But Lazarus was the one who sat at the table with him. Martha served. Martha's serving. As well as we see in verse 3 that Mary is worshiping. And this is the same Martha who not too long ago in Luke chapter 10 verse 38 through 42 was the one that was complaining, Lord, tell my sister to come help me in the kitchen and serve. And once again, Jesus says, leave her alone for what she is doing. The one thing is needed, which was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha had once misplaced her priorities in serving, but no more. She is serving, but now she's serving with the proper heart. And the key to service and to serving the Lord is a natural response of thankfulness and love for the Lord. I like what Pastor David says. He, he says, do you know that we are saved to serve? We are all have been saved to serve the Lord. We have not been saved for our own works. We have been saved to serve the Lord. The fact is what you worship, you will always sacrifice for and you will serve. Isn't that amazing? That whatever it is that you worship, you will always sacrifice for it and you will serve. Luke chapter four, verses five through eight says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Whatever it is that we worship, we serve. Think about those things tonight in your life that have a tendency to consume your thoughts. What are those things tonight that are consuming your thinking? What are those things that are keeping you up in the middle of the night that has grabbed all your attention? What are those things? What are those things that you put a whole lot of energy into? And, and what happens is that we become so wrapped up in it that we begin to turn our worship towards it and we begin to serve it. It can be your marriage. It can be your job. It can be your position. It can be somebody. But whatever it is that we put our attention to and whatever it is that's consuming our thoughts, that's what we're worshiping. Ask yourself tonight, what do I find myself thinking about the most during the day? What are those things that are worrying me? What are those things that are eating me up inside that have consumed my thoughts? And whatever it is, whatever it is, if it begins to shadow or overshadow our worship for the Lord, 
then it's become your God. Because whatever we worship, we serve. And God plainly said in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, that you shall have no other gods before me. Our worship is for God only. The fact is, is that service to God is often expressed through service to others. Faith needs to be expressed by actions or it's not genuine. James chapter 2 verse 26 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. And you know, you guys, I've been convicted of this in my own life because my faith in Jesus and my service to God needs to be expressed through others. And how am I to do this? I'm to love. Love. Love is how we express our service and our worship to God. An earmark of a Christian is the love of what we do for one another and our expression of service to one another. So what does this mean? That if we have somebody in need, we help them. You know, I was sharing not too long ago how we measure intelligence. There's a standardized test that we use. It's called an intelligence quotient, an IQ. We use that for a number of different things to measure a number of different things for people who are applying for pretty, uh, some big jobs. And, and we use this intelligent quotient to gauge their intelligence. But there's also another type of quotient that I want to ask you tonight is I don't want to ask what your IQ is. I want to ask what your LQ is. What is your love quotient? If I were to ask you from a scale of 1 to 10, 10 saying, man, I love Jesus so much, and 1 saying, I don't love Jesus, and I was to ask you to tell me your score, everybody being super spiritual in here, I'm sure would say a 10. How much do you love Jesus? And in your heart, you're saying, John, I'm at a 10. Because I love the Lord. I serve him. I worship him. I'm, I'm here every Sunday. I'm here every Wednesday. But you know how we measure the love for the Lord? It's how we love others. The way we measure our love quotient is how we love and serve others. That knocked my score from a 10 plus, plus, plus to like a negative three. And it really put things in perspective for me. And I think about what we see here in the next following verses is an example of love, service, and a true act of worship. Look at verse 3. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not because that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. So what do we learn from Mary's actions? One, her action was very costly. Judas estimated the cost of that genuine spike nerd ointment to about to be about 300 denarii. A denarius was one day's wage, and 300 denarii was approximately one year wage. Spike nard was probably from Nepal, but most likely from India, and it was very costly and very oily. It was a costly oil that was used in Egypt by kings and princes, and, and a well, as well as in Rome, and obviously here in Israel. But it's important to point out that a pound was equal to 12 ounces, and this is the amount that Mary used. Now, when I speak about this part, my wife gets a little excited. Hi, honey. She's at home with the sick kids. But listen, perfume, how many women in here like perfume? Some of you guys are being shy tonight. <laughs> I smell the church when I come in. Some people have it on a lot. But listen to some of the prices of perfume. Chanel number no. five, hundred and twenty dollars an ounce. That's cool. Listen to this one. Clive. Now, if, tell me if, if I pronounce these wrong, just correct me after service. 
I don't know how to say any a lot of these things, but listen to this one. Clive Christian's Imperial Majesty, $215,000 for 16.9 ounces. It's about $12,721 an ounce. Honey, don't get any, don't get any ideas. Okay, here's a tongue twister. Baccarat's Les Larme or Larmis Sacris de Thebes. $1,700 for a quarter of an ounce, or about $6,800 an ounce. Clive Christian's number one, $2,150 for two ounces. Ralph Lauren Notorious, $3,540 for 2.2 ounces. And then this one here is, I called it Hermes, but it's Herme. <laughs> Herme Perfume 24 Faber, $1,500 an ounce. Mary's perfume, that points out in verse 5, was 12, was 12 ounces, and it was valued at approximately $4,000 an ounce in today's standards. So it would have been equivalent to one year's wage of about $48,000. Her gift was very expensive. But to, but to her, Jesus, it was well worth it. Because she loved him. People stand in line for all kinds of events. For movies, concerts, plays, restaurants, sporting events, just to get a glimpse or their favorite star. And all of this incurs a cost and a sacrifice. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to movies, concerts, and sporting events. But once again, when we become, it becomes a point in our life where we worship it, we're serving it. In fact, our old nature is so self-centered and is constantly directed to self-satisfaction. But when we give to the Lord and worship Him, it breaks our old nature's desire for self, and we become more like Jesus who gave himself for us. Mary gave her most prized possession, her most treasured possession to Jesus, but our possessions may not be as worth as Mary's, or it might not have that cost as much as Mary's. And that was true for Martha. Martha was, didn't care about perfume, but she valued the work of service. Her sacrifice, to Jesus was, her sacrifice to Jesus was perspiration rather than perfume. And it was just as noble and just as worthy and just as value as Mary's sacrifice. So my question to you tonight is, what would you give Jesus? What is your most prized possession? For some people, it may be their bank accounts, which I'm telling you, that's not mine. For others, it's a position at work, and for some, it's a relationship. But the question is, would you give it? And would you give it your all? We will make it available, will we make it available for Jesus' use? And Mary gave humbly her best to Jesus. And we see here at the end of verse 3 is when she did this. When she, when she wiped his feet with her hair, the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who had betrayed him, said, why wasn't this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? You know, it's interesting that we can picture in our minds Mary who comes in, and it says that she used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. In that culture, hair was a Symbolic of, woman's, of a woman's glory, and she lavished Jesus' feet with her glory because she was self-forgetting. She was passionate. And there are times when we should not shy away from such open and passionate love and worship for our Jesus. We should let our tears fall in. And Jesus said of Mary in Matthew 26, 10, she has done a beautiful thing to me. You know, we think about that time when people would wear sandals. There was no tennis shoes. There were no paved highways. And people would walk and their feet would get really grimy and really dirty. And, and the fact that she came in and, and got onto her knees before a rabbi, teacher, the son of God, she crossed all social norms and, and cross-cultural 
boundaries and she didn't care, but she gave her all to worship Jesus. And she comes and she kneels and she's pouring her tears out on his feet and using this spike nard and anointing his feet and using her hair to wipe this and wipe his feet. And what a selfless, passionate act of worship. John adds at the end of verse 3 that the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. And this tells us that Mary didn't use a tiny pinch of the spike nard to anoint Jesus' feet. She broke the whole container. She gave him her all. And we can learn from this because when we worship Jesus, we need to give him our all. Not just a tiny little pinch, but we need to give him everything. We need to have a selfless, passionate worship for our king who went to the cross and gave us his all that we may have salvation in him. What is our worship to Jesus tonight? You know, sitting up here in the front tonight, hearing everybody worship was a beautiful thing. And I started thinking to myself, do I selflessly, selfishly or selflessly worship my king? It's interesting that we see in verse 5, Judas's response. I find it interesting that the first recorded utterance of Judas ever is he asks the question, why? This is a common response of people who do not understand our worship and our love to Jesus Christ. When we surrender our lives to, and to our Lord and Savior Jesus, the initial response of those who are, who are watching by or seeing us will ask us, why? Why are you giving your all to Jesus? Why are you worshiping him? Why are you giving him tithes and offerings? Why do you do this and why do you do that? And this is what we see Judas saying here. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? We have those around us that don't understand our love and worship for Jesus Christ. And they ask why. Why not sell this money and give it to the poor? I bet Judas sounded very impressive he sounded like he was sensitive. He was, he was not a bad guy. And, and I can imagine people saying, oh, look, he has a concern for the poor. He's such a good man. But Judas was using his concern for the poor to decide to disguise his grief, for Judas was a thief. And in verse 6, we see that he, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he, he used to take what was put in it. Mary was a selfless, giving believer, but Judas was a selfish, greedy materialist. To the heart that has never met God, worship means the most impractical, wasteful pursuit, and Judas is a profile of hell. But we look at verses 7 and 8, but Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the, the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. This reveals Mary's spiritual discernment. Many commentators believe that because of her devotion to Jesus and her worship to Jesus and sitting at the feet of Jesus, that she had, she had seen more than the rest that Jesus' death was approaching. His disciples had no clue. But Mary did. Why? Because she selflessly worshipped Jesus and was sitting at his feet. What's your devotional life looking like? How's your time spending with the Lord? Only you can answer that. And I've mentioned this before, but a lot of times we have this mentality as we drive through a, a drive through at a fast food restaurant, and we have that same mentality with our devotional life. And it's no wonder we're in the desert. It's no wonder we're in the wilderness. And sometimes we have a busy schedule, and we open up the Bible, and it says, therefore my heart shall resound like a harp of Moab. Lord, bless this time. Thank you, Jesus. Is that our worship for our king? You know, Pastor David was mentioning on, on Sunday that when we serve, as an act of worship to our king, there's a danger of it becoming burdensome. There's a danger for it to become, oh, I gotta serve again. And when our heart 
is in that place, spiritually we're in a dangerous place. Because our worship for the Lord should be giving. Our worship to our king should be selfless. It's never about us. And we see in verse 9, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there and he, they came not for Jesus, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they may also see Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Lazarus has become Jesus' star witness. And I find this amazing because as we read through the Gospels, we really don't find anything that, that makes Lazarus stand out. He never seems to have said anything or do anything worth recording in the Gospels, yet he ends up being one of the greatest star witnesses for Jesus. And why is that? The answer is not in what Lazarus did for Jesus. Rather, it is what Jesus has done for Lazarus. Even though we may not have the faintest trace of being a genius or we may have a little that we could only bring to Jesus, yet if we were dead in our sins and, and if a voice over us has cried out, come forth, and we have been risen to a newness of life, and our king has said, loose him and let him go, so now that we are all set free, haven't we also become a star witness of Jesus Christ? If we had the opportunity tonight to have everybody stand up and share what Jesus has done in your life, there would be evidence to support that Jesus has changed your life. And we have become star witnesses for Jesus in every place that we're at. We have become star witnesses of the great, amazing grace that Jesus has poured into our lives. We have the, the amazing testimony that Jesus has set us free. Look what Jesus has done in your life. Look at the amazing work that he's accomplished in your life. You know, Martha was serving with all she had and Mary was pouring out all she had before Jesus in a compassionate, selfless act of worship. Lazarus was an emblem of a new life in Jesus and this is a remarkable, complete picture of what happens when Jesus touches the lives of those around him. Our li in our lives, regardless of the range of years that has separated us from this event, regardless of the years of service that we have served regardless of the mental and intellectual and spiritual attainments, there's one thing that should be foremost in our lives, and it's that Jesus Christ has changed our lives. Mary and Martha both gave their best, and they both spread an aroma, one with everyday acts of ordinary service, and the other with exotic spikenard. Both aromas came pouring in, into the lives out of dedication to Jesus. When we do that, we can expect the fragrance of Jesus to follow us. Do we want our lives to be a fragrance to Jesus and a blessings to others? If so, we need to get down on our knees and we need to anoint him with our, with, well, I couldn't do it with my hair. But we need to get on our knees and we need to anoint him and we need to give Jesus our everything. Mary's worship and giving is a model for us to follow in our worship and giving. And I want to take us through a little storyline as we wrap this up tonight. I begin to think about when, when Mary came in, because in Mark chapter 14, it gives the same account, but it, it changes a little bit because it says that the same woman, Mary, comes in and she has a flask of, of spikenard and, and she breaks the flask and she pours the oil over Jesus' head. And because it's oil, and because we know that Jesus has a beard because it tells us that his beard was plucked, then I imagine that the oil saturates his hair, it saturates his beard, and it saturates a little bit of his robe. 
And then we see him wash the disciples' feet in John chapter 13. And I wonder if he gets a whiff of that perfume and is reminded of how much Mary loves him. Then he sits at the dinner table with his disciples and, and he tells them that the next time he drinks of the fruit of the vine, it will be with them He's in, when they're in heaven. And he breaks the bread and he gives them communion and, and for the last time here on earth. And I wonder if he gets a whiff of that perfume and is reminded of how much Mary loves him. Then he goes forth to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's in anguish and in turmoil and he pleads with the Father to take this cup from me three times, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I imagine he gets a whiff of that perfume and he's reminded of how much Mary loves him. The Garden of Gethsemane where he struggled, the sweats were like drops of blood his soul was exceedingly troublesome, sorrowful. And then when the soldiers take him away and they lead him to the high priest before the crowd, they, they begin to spit in his face and they, bring in, they begin to hit him with open palms. And I bet he gets a whiff of that perfume and is reminded of how much Mary loves him. Then he's taken to Pilate and then to King Herod and then be back to Pilate and eventually he's scourged. 39 times with a cat of nine tails. You guys know this. Where his flesh is ripped open and his blood is, is bleeding and his organs are exposed and, and he's just shredded. And it's interesting that Isaiah chapter 52 says that his visage was so marred that he didn't even look like a man. And I bet he gets a whiff of that perfume and is reminded of how much Mary loves him. Beaten, his beard plucked out, what they would do is get a stick this long, and then the stick, they would have little, little sticks sticking up, and they would put it in his beard and twist it, and then yank it. His flesh would come off. Then they would get a crown of thorns, it's not this crown of thorns that we neatly see in Hallmark pictures. The crowns of briar thorns, this big. And they shove it on his head and hit him over the head with a stick. And they pound it into his head. And I bet he gets a whiff of that perfume and is reminded of how much Mary loves him. He's nailed to the cross. He's hanging in shame, bearing all the sin of the world and on his shoulders. And before he takes his last breath, he even shouts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'm wondering, did he get a whiff of that perfume? And was he reminded of how much Mary loved him? I get this feeling that when Jesus smelled this perfume that Mary poured out on him, kept him going for his love for you, his love for me. You know, it's interesting to point out that at any time with the blood loss that Jesus suffered and all the things that Jesus went through, it, it would have been, I don't want to say normal or typical, but it would have been easy for him just to pass out there on the side and not take, make it to the cross because of the blood loss medically. He should have, it should have happened that way. But it was his love for you that drove him to that cross. You know, also, I, I have these ideas, and, and I think about when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's saying, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. And I wonder if he gets a flash of each one of our faces at that moment and says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will, because I love them. Does your life and your worship for God leave a long-lasting aroma to remind Jesus how much you love him? This is an area I'm working on. And once again, I'm reminded that this passage shares with us that Mary didn't use a tiny pinch of the spikenard oil, that she broke the whole flask and gave it her all. And we can learn from this type of worship. 
that when we worship Jesus, we need to give him our all. And when we give our all to Jesus as an act of worship, the place that we're in will be filled with the fragrance of the aroma of the oil. The sweet smelling perfume, the aroma, the fragrance of Jesus that fills our life, our hearts and people see this. What's your fragrance tonight? Is it a pleasing aroma to the Lord? Or is it a stench? What's your worship for the Lord like? I'm telling you guys, this is an area I'm working on. John 12, 3 says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. When we worship, serve, and give God our best to God, our fragrance will fill the room. Do we want our lives to be a fragrance for our king? If so, we need to get down on our knees at Jesus' feet and anoint him and given him everything we have.